Thank you all. Thanks for having me, and it's it is good to be back. Yeah. Is this a is this a group of all seniors? No. no. You're a senior. I'm a freshman. Okay. Gotcha. Freshman. Y'all like freshman hoopers or something? Y'all are some tall freshmen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. Very cool. Um, well, this was where I took my senior year art class, and actually I took art for the first time as a senior at MBA. So I was really grateful for that. Um, just that exposure and introduction to it. I hadn't really seriously considered making art, um, and definitely not making art for a living, but, uh, but I hadn't, that, that was my introduction. And, and this piece to your, this side, to the right, is, that's the self-portrait that I did my senior year of high school, senior year at MBA. And I was sitting back in that corner, and the teacher is Jim Walmack, who some of you all may have seen come in and out, but he retired a couple years ago. And he was my senior year art art teacher. So, so yeah, it was um, yeah, cool to exp you know experience what it was. Yeah, just to really start something brand new as a, as a senior. I, as I said, you know, we'd been I'd been playing sports kind of my whole life. That was the the path that I was looking at is going playing college basketball and and my math my major was math for my first three years of school and then after really kind of settling into yeah, the, how much I liked my art electives. I started taking art electives in college because I, I just enjoyed them. It's kind of my favorite thing to do. And took enough of those until I changed majors and, and majored in graphic design. The studio art was definitely the, the path and track that I went on. Afterlife took a lot of, a lot of, a lot of turns. And so uh, this is a piece that I made recently. Um, can anybody tell what that's painted on? What the surface is? Well, like or like what the um, what the canvas is made out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little little tougher to see from the distance and from the front, but it's um it's actually on denim. So I took some of my old paint jeans and stretched them on the stretcher bars, and and worked this you know figure into the foreground and then the negative space is the denim just showing through so that's kind of the same overalls that I was wearing as a three or four year old this is another self-portrait so you'll see a, a lot of self-portraits which is um yeah I'm not sure if that's if that's arrogance or trauma but <laughs> for whatever reason I paint myself a lot and I think a big part of it you know you know jokes aside is is it helps me kind of work through whatever I'm going through in life at the time. And so, so yeah, that, I think my senior year of high school, as I look at that self-portrait, that feels pretty accurate, you know? And then the, the one of me when I was three or four, that feels pretty accurate too. Um, so yeah, we can take a look at some of the, uh, some of the, the images up there. Well, it's not a self-portrait, but I did get to know him pretty well, and it could have been. Yeah, yeah. There's some some of my paintings aren't super, super realistic, and so, so yeah. Anybody see any kind of? Tell me what you tell me what you see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. I call it college. Uh, I think I, I really discovered the, 
then I guess it's like a tree and then like the roots and then the ground. Mm -hmm. And then the building, I think that is the background. So I think mean, the contrast looks really nice. It's pops. So is that a tent on the right side? So? It is. What do you think the tent might be all about? Who would you think the, the tent? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's like where you're just like that person's living. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's kind of what, what was going on with this series. It's a uh, body work called Still Life, and I'm incorporating people into these still life scenes. We set up a little, a little still life here just to, you know, give a, give a sort of idea of what, you know, I'm taking something that might be on this scale and incorporating it into a large scale painting. And the, that play on words is just the idea of someone also, um, also being life, like someone who might, um, you know, be experiencing homelessness or being kind of a challenging uh, position in life, still being life, also being life. And so, so there's a couple of paintings where I'm using still life, like flower, vases, fruit, um, anything that's constructed as a still life image and incorporating people that are experiencing homelessness into that, into that scene. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use your art to like promote um, like how you think from like political standpoint or like certain ideals that you like, agree with or like value in your life? Do you ever like use your art to like exemplify that or uh, kind of just like, elaborate what you think, what you believe in? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I I try to be as objective as possible. Um, and of course, we're all looking at things from our perspective where, you know, I, yeah, there's, you know, I, there are two people that can sit right next to each other. And, you know, I might have sat right next to someone else at MBA and the two of us had completely different experiences and might have told a completely different story about, you know, about, you know, whether it's the school or the education or the culture or the environment. And so, so yeah, I mean, I ideally am trying to just tell the truth. And so the truth is going to come from my, from my perspective. But, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a big part of my artwork is sharing things that, that I've found to be true from my perspective. And because I'm sharing it through artwork, it's really letting the viewer pick up whatever they want to pick up. Because when someone sees this painting, it, they don't necessarily, they, for one thing, they don't see me. <laughs> so they don't know what my background is. They don't know, you know the things that I really care about. And so they can kind of have that conversation and that interaction with the painting, and and that's my that's my my hope is that it brings in some, brings up something in them because I think the most effective way to communicate is to put something in front of someone and see what it brings out in them instead of me saying this is what I believe and I really would like you to believe it too. <laughs> so do you, yeah. want, do you want people to like interpret your art in one way or like multiple ways? I think you're kind of saying like multiple ways. Yeah, I say multiple. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even like not right there, like you can bring up the tent and the homelessness, or you could, mm -hmm. you could like look at the skateboard with the, the white socks hat or with the shoes he's wearing. Yeah, yeah, or even if he's at a pretty large scale, I mean, he looks kind of monumental. So, I mean, he's, there's something that's kind of uplifting him to even, even to be in a painting kind of means somebody thought you were important enough to paint you. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. You like there drawing? I was. I was sketching there. I did the painting probably a couple years later. But I did sketch it there at the time and talked to him, and we, we got to have a pretty good good interaction. Was this in, where was this? This was in, in, in this was Los Angeles. Yeah, mm -hmm. How long did it take? This painting was maybe a year beginning to end, but two or three weeks, four weeks of actual time working on the working on the painting mm -hmm. yeah and now i'm forgetting if i've said the, the the three weeks and 30 years thing <laughs> that was last time <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah i did have an old artist who would tell me paintings took him two weeks and 30 years because two weeks to paint the painting and 30 years to get the you know the skill to paint the painting and it's kind of like this example of that took two months that took a week but it took me 25 years of painting to get to the point of being able to do that in a week.
So if like you paint uh, like you drew that like your senior year and that was your first one, did you like realize that you had the natural ability as well? Um, or was it more I realized that I that I really enjoyed it, you know. Um, I think I enjoyed the internal feeling of it more so than than the result, because I think it's it's also hard to, you know, you know we don't create anything in isolation, and so I'm kind of making something, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's better than I thought it could be, but it's nothing compared to what like Michael Griffin, who some of you all <laughs> know, it's like compared to what some of the other artists in my class were doing just from the. Yeah, from, from the skill, technique, structure, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think a huge part of, you know, artwork and really anything is, you know, you're sort of, for lack of other word, competing with yourself. It's like you're, if, if you feel like this is good progress for where you are and where you've been, then, then it is. It's good progress for where you are and, and, and where you've been, and, and if you feel good making the work, then you're going to keep on getting better and better because you're going to keep showing up. You'll keep showing up every day. Everybody knows the person that loves doing something versus the person that's just good at it. It's like if there's a, if an athlete loves playing, they're going to be good at that sport. You know, Kevin Durant's great because you can't, he can't stand in the gym and not shoot. He just can't do it. I mean, he, he's, if you see him go around the country to random stuff, before you know it, he's, he's on the court playing. That's why that's, that's part of why he's great. He's also he's seven foot, his arms are long, his handles are crazy. Like he's <laughs> there's there's multiple things that make him great, but that's that's what separates him from someone who's really talented, earns a great living doing it, but it's not what they kind of live and breathe. So um, so yeah, I, I think I found that art was something that I love doing enough that I'm gonna do it consistently regardless. And so over the years, you know, the technique is kind of caught up with the um, yeah just just the love and the internal feeling that I had when I was when I was doing it mm -hmm. how about this um, same series tell me what's showing up in this in this piece waffle house. waffle house man there you go the awful waffle man it's still still going strong <laughs> yes and, and the review mirror mm -hmm. or the side view yeah Thanks. Um, kind of in the mirror, you see that's car, the, the car on the road, and then there's like a little, I don't know what it's called, I know it's like a sidewalk, the little area that separates yeah, the, 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 the guy, the guy standing there. I don't know if uh, he's supposed to, but kind of looks like maybe he's like a homeless person on the side of the street, because oftentimes you see most people you know, on like, corners of the road or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's all I first, but. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was getting at, and that's, that's White Bridge Road in Charlotte, so where that Waffle House is, real close to here, and and that is one of the one of the people that stand on that yeah stand on that street. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also flowers on top of the mirror. Yeah, and that's kind of getting back to that still life. That's that still life series of incorporating the still life imagery into um, into these into the pieces that are also looking at homelessness mm -hmm. and people are people experiencing homelessness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why do you uh what like made you want to like focus on like, homelessness mm -hmm. yeah it's it's something that i've always been really um just kind of interested in uh interested in 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 really in the sense of of what makes some people exist in that space and then what makes us exist in the space that we're in when neither person really does anything to deserve it you know and that's that's uh, that's something that, that always stood out to me about NBA when I was here and and of course now when I come back it's the same thing that there's you know that there, there's an extreme amount of privilege just to be here it doesn't it doesn't matter what background you came from to get here if you're here you're in a you're, you're in some place of privilege. I mean, that's, that's just the, the, the reality of this kind of environment, this kind of school, these kind of resources. And so when I was a pretty small kid and seeing like, you know, there are people that haven't done anything different from me. It's like, I didn't, I'm, I'm no more deserving of this than they are of that. Um, then it's just something that I kind of started looking at. And as, you know, people that, as someone making artwork, it naturally, 
as an interest. It became something that I started making, you know, making work around. And yeah, I, I used to do pieces on these big doors where I would flip doors horizontal and paint, um, paint images on those. I took pieces of cardboard and did drawings on the cardboard. Um, and so there was a few different kind of things that showed up before I got to this actual idea of still life. But it was all born around people existing in, um, some people existing with a lot of resources and some existing with hardly any. And there's really not much difference in the people, you know. So, do you have an opinion on um, graffiti? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I have an opinion, but I, I, I got an appreciation for it. Yeah. Tell what, what do you tell me? What do you what do you think? I know that's kind of like vague, not actually happening, but yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like you can with graffiti. It's kind of like one of those things that like you can you can make a piece of art, mm -hmm. and you can have like, somewhere about graffiti. I feel like everyone's. It does. Like, like yeah. you, you do graffiti on, let's say, a bridge. Yeah. Right? People are going to see that and see what that is. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the only way that I can see it is if you put something over it. So yeah. I feel, like, uh, I feel like graffiti, if you, if you want to like, make a statement or if you want to do something, or, not even make a statement, if you just want to just put your heart out there, I feel yeah. like it's, it's really good to do that. But I also kind of see like, the side of it that's illegal, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of, the, yeah, I think that's a great point and it's exactly correct. I mean, s graffiti for years was called graffiti and it was like, you know, people on skateboards listening to hip hop tagging stuff, like, and that was the image of it. And then it turned into public art and public art is people making murals and making 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 thousand dollars for these murals that are, and some of the exact same artists, I mean, woke an artist that we talked about earlier today who's a, a good buddy who was initially a graffiti artist and he was a visual artist too i mean he did paintings but but his kind of foundation was was spray paint graffiti and now he's you know he's a muralist and he makes public art that you can't paint over <laughs> because it's you know it's it's sanctioned you know and so, so yeah so i think that's it's a really um yeah really important part of the, you know, I don't, I don't love words like the art world, but it's an important part of it because it is accessible. You know, everybody, everybody gets it. You don't have to be in a museum. You don't have to be in a gallery. You don't have to be of some economic standing. You know, public artwork is for everybody. So, so yeah, I, I'm in, in that sense, love it and think that it's a, a really um, important outlet. It's something that I've done myself. Um, more, than, more murals than, than you know, the, than, than graffiti. I mean, part of the, the thing that I never liked about it personally is that, for one, it could be covered, two, it was illegal, and, and you don't typically get paid for it. <laughs> and, I, and I would always feel like if I'm putting this much into a piece of public artwork, then why does that artist get nothing but the sculptor who puts the thing up, you know, gets $200,000, <laughs> you know? So, so I think there was a little bit of that inequity in, in how, you know, muralists and graffiti artists were historically viewed, and a lot of that's changing. Which yeah, that's Troy, I think Troy Duff up, up top. He's a vis visual artist who, I mean, his foundation was graffiti, um, and he does, I mean, he does the similar work on canvas, but he still does walls, buildings, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would think you all would have met Troy before yeah, at some point. Well, yeah, we can check out the next, uh, the next image. All right, who thinks, uh, who knows what might be going on here? Uh, yeah. Maybe like a bed and kind of like a cell? Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. You can see like a pillow is like a pair of like, you have three mouse like headphones. Yeah. Maybe I'm just seeing that, but I can see it. Like yeah, that's there. Yeah, headphones, a little radio, put it to the walls. Mm-hmm. I see, like, you use, like, shade to show kind of, like, the, the objects of the sources. Does anyone know what, um, what media I'm using there? Is that what I'm drawing with? Uh, oh, maybe a pasta. Close. Can you do the rest of the 
make sharp point pencil to send it on. So yeah. I thought that was pencil at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is. Yeah, so that's been on the rubber a whole lot, and it's kind of sharp. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this drawing, he was drawing in 2012 and a really challenging stretch of life. So I'll actually pull out the, um, yeah, pull out the original sketch. Um, so let's see. These are all, essentially, it's such a small, small group because I can. Yeah, we can really, really talk directly to you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's, yeah, but these are both drawings from, yeah, both from 2012. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, there was a drawing, a poem, and a painting that all, all sort of went together. And yeah, we'll, yeah. So you all can take a look at the painting for a second. I'll read it, but I'll, but I'll, I'll give you all a minute with it first. Oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, we'll take a look at the, we'll look at the, take a look at the painting first. That sounds good. That's yeah, good. yeah. That is. That's a self-portrait, really large scale. So eight by eight feet. So is that like a picture like you and Stella painted, or? It it is. Yeah. So I, I painted that in 2020, but the reference, which was out of my head, it wasn't really a reference that I. That was from 20. 2012 or, or so, which is when these drawings came were from. I'll let you all pass these around. Yeah. Mm hmm So yeah, it's the height of the probably the door frame and the width of kind of the width of that wall. That's that's a pretty good Yeah, that's a pretty good um, good idea of what that of what that scale was. Yeah. So yeah. That one did. That took probably close to a year. Um, and again, I didn't go straight through, you know, worked on it for a while, but it was in my living room. I've got a home studio, so I don't work in an external studio, except for in, in LA I do, but in Nashville, my studio is just in the common area of my house. And so, so of course it was looking at me as I was creating it. And, um, and that was pretty challenging. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was, but, but it, it did, it took probably more, definitely over six months. And to get the memory, like I knew what the cell looked like. I mean, I'd, I'd been there for three and a half years, so I knew exactly what it looked like. Um, but I, I didn't know, like, actually how the shadows would hit and everything. So I built a little, little shoebox diorama to, to, um, to place everything and see where the angles were. Yeah, yeah. When you. I did. So anything, everything you saw here would, was made while I was there. Was made while I was in. Yeah, this was after, but it was at a, a at a reporting. You know, AM pro reporting. But yeah, we'll share the poem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that'd be great. That is the one you said. Yeah, that's that's it. So so this painting came from that. Um, this drawing. Yeah, this drawing is basically like a preliminary sketch for that painting. Now, when I drew this, this was eight years before I painted that. So I had no idea that, for one, I had no idea that I was going to be doing artwork full time, but also no idea that I would ever even want to paint myself in that, in that space. Um, but I felt like it was important to paint. And a big part of it was for me, it was kind of my own therapeutic just kind of moving through the emotions of it. But it was also the, um, 
you know, to, for, to, to be able to have, have the viewer spend that kind of close time with me in that, in that state. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're close now, but people never really see anyone actually in their prison cell. You might go to a visit or see someone that came out or whatever, but, but to, you know, to spend that time with someone who you know on this side while they're there, I think it can help change, it can help change the viewpoint. You know, it, it can kind of help change how you might view someone who's in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Like, because you're there for like three and a half years, did art like, kind of like help you like waste, or like use some of your time? To oh yeah. To yeah, I mean, time and um, really just like emo emotionally, yeah, yeah. As far as time, funny enough, you're pretty busy in there <laughs> because everybody has a job. You, you go and you work in, you know, manufacturing factories. You know, there, there's some kind of labor that you do while you're there. You might work in the kitchen or you might work in the plumbing in the facility. So, so you, you work eight hour days and then you, you go to the gym or the or whatever. And so, so it's, it's, it's interestingly enough, your schedule is, is more, more full than, than one would think. But the artwork definitely helped with the um, helped with the, with the, the emotional side of it and, and just the liberating side of feeling free while I was there. Somebody give me a guess of how much do you think you get paid an hour as a uh, as a as a inmate worker? Now you you're working making the same like say um, the food that you might get in a not in this cafeteria but like a hospital cafeteria. We'd make that kind of food, you know. So it's stuff that gets sold, you know, some, some like cheap clothes. So you're manufacturing things that are sold at market value. Oh, but so you're making stuff and you get money for the stuff you're making? We, you do get paid. You get, you get paid uh, an hourly rate. I, just was, I wanted you all to see, see if you can guess what your hourly rate, the hourly rate was when you, when you first started. Starting rate as a... Five, starting $5 an hour. Mm-hmm. This no. is... Yeah, 20, yeah, 20, 10, 12, yeah, 20, 10, 20 years. So there could be a lot of art, history, though, the starting rate, and like, how real life is. Sure. Close. Sure. I see. Yeah. Oh. Three dollars. Close. 19 cents. Mm. Hey, 19 cents an hour. Yeah. And so at the end of the month, you'd get about a $20 check, and that's, and that would be your, that'd be your monthly, and you know, you'd, you'd get, you know, snacks, soap, whatever. But yeah, 19 cents an hour. That's, um, I don't know if you've if heard of this, the thing they call the 13th, 13th Amendment, where their slavery was abolished except for in prisons. That's kind of why they say that, because it's, it's a slave labor type of camp, basically, because you're making things that are still sold at regular rates, but you're getting paid 19 to 50 cents an hour. 50 is usually what you top out at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to how you said it's like jail. Yeah, well, you, um, I, I was, it was a drug possession. And wow. I did, uh, yeah, drug possession. And the full length of the sentence was 15 years, and I did three and a half and got out on parole, and that's what I'm, what I'm completing now. I'll finish that in 2023, so next year. So, but it started in 2008, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Besides, like, going to jail, I was going to pay for me, I mean, I don't really try to circumstance, and that's not, obviously, my deal, that's not my business, but besides going there and realizing, like, hey, I probably should have done something that I did, mm -hmm. did jail, did it kind of, like, open your eyes to kind of what, why reality is, because, you say you grew up, you went here, mm -hmm. you went to Belmont, TSC? Yeah, for graduating. I graduated after I got out. Though. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you know, going to jail, I mean, I guess I, I don't know your exact circumstances, mm -hmm. but did it kind of like, was it kind of like a, like a wake up call or was it kind of like a, like a wow, I've really learned something like out of that here? Or how did it, did it, did it change you at all? Or what did it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, dramatically. Yeah. And I mean, I think the wake up call was that, um, I think probably the, the, the biggest thing that I 
realize with this, there's a lot of really great people that are sitting in prison forever. A lot of really smart people. A lot of you know people that are kind of this close that you know that sit there for you know forever for whatever circumstances. And I was fortunate enough to be able to get out and have you know some some family and friends and community. God, I mean, like yeah, down to Mr. Walmack and the people that yeah community around that that were invested in me and me seeing you know seeing the other side. Um, yeah, and, and so, so yeah, that's, that's, and I'm going to go for it, and then, then we're going to check out that poem, but you, uh, you go, yeah, go ahead. What made you want to move to L.A.? Um, just, it, it felt a little more, um, just kind of liberating. Yeah, yeah, I think, like, culturally, the diversity, a little more open-minded, and I've been in Nashville my whole life, which, and I love Nashville, that's why I'm still here, but, um, but it definitely felt like a, a place where, um, where there was a lot of different kinds of people, and yeah, kind of be, kind of be yourself, whoever that self ended up being. And so I see the UCLA. Is that is that something you're you're considering, or? Well, like my dad's from UCLA, so I was like, wait, wait, say it again. My dad's from UCLA, so I'm an Alabama fan, but. Oh yeah, well then at football, hey, that's that's SEC. Now Pac-12 can't really, you know. But but as far as places to go to school, yeah, yeah, yeah so, I, that'd be a fun one. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we'll. I like the colors too. I, I used to wear a UCLA sweatshirt just because I like the sky blue and the yellow. Even yeah, I wasn't really a fan, but. Um, so this poem was written at the same time that 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 this drawing from in 2012. And uh, so yeah, you can read along. I'll um, yeah, share that share that with you. So it's about the bird that would always sit in my window. So this black bird, this black bird lands on my window. The same bird every morning. I guess it's the same. All I've seen is its shadow, but it says hello every day, every morning. I fly away with my little black friend every day, every morning. My mind on its back, free on its wings. Though I only see it through bars, we meet at the screen. It visits me every morning, every day. It brings me hope. It feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. It brings me hope. It feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. So for now, I guess I'm free. My little black friend, it visits me every morning, every day. So, so yeah, that's kind of the that was that was sort of the moment. I think that was the the moment of being there and realizing that that I could be free, no matter where I was. And art was a really really big part of that of that moment. So I think that's why I still do it every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, uh, when you got like right out of college, mm -hmm. did you? Start right art, or did you take like a corporate job? Yeah. Percent basketball. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I've never, I've never worked a nine to five. I did restaurant work after my first time in undergrad, but I didn't graduate. So I went to Belmont for three years. I transferred, went to MTSU, and when I left MTSU, I um. I, I just worked in restaurants, and so when I worked, I worked in restaurants for a number of years, and um, kind of that that third year at Belmont, I had some mental health issues, and that was kind of where it started to get get kind of kind of kind of tough as far as the college sports went. Um, but I still went to MTSU, planning to play there, and there was you know some issues, coach coach left and whatnot. But um, but yeah, that that yeah, I, I never I never really. Um, had an in between outside of restaurant work. Yeah, I did restaurant work for 17 years, <laughs> and uh, and I did art work alongside that for the last. But um, but making work full time didn't happen until after after I, I got out. Um, yeah, I, I was making artwork before that, and did start in high school and in college. But making it daily and and kind of pushing towards making it for a career didn't happen until probably 2014. 
And that's when I graduated high school. I mean, that's where I graduated college. So even though I started college in 98, after taking all the time off and leaving school and getting back and being inside and whatnot, I, I graduated in 2014. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about like when you started? Was it hard to, I don't know how to phrase this, but like, was it hard at first to, just the place, I might be wrong, but what I think about art is, art is like hard to make it art like financially, so like at first, was it like difficult or was it hard to kind of like, get exposure to your pieces or like how, how did you really like make it a career? Yeah, yeah, I always kind of, you know, tell young artists that, I mean, it's, to me, it's as hard as anything else, where most jobs at the beginning, you show up eight to 10 hours a day, and you start up at the lowest end of the pay scale. And with art, if you show up eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week, you better believe you're gonna make some money, <laughs> you know? And so I think that's, I think it was, it was, it is harder at the beginning, but I think especially from where I was coming from and because I, I was making art out of necessity, like out of, out of emotional necessity and then, you know, financially everything kind of, kind of worked out. But, but yeah, I think that it is, um, yeah, the, I, I don't think that art is actually more challenging financially than any other career. I just think that it is, it is, for one, it's a lot of self-motivation. You don't have there, there isn't a, a time to clock in except for your own personal clock. And, um, and, and yeah, it just kind of unfolds a little bit differently. But, but yeah, I think that art, art as a career has as good of an upside financially as any other, as any other career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you the one uh, who, I think I saw the three, three, one made like that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kobe and LeBron, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That was me last year. Year before, maybe. Okay. Cool. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably. Probably then. Yeah. My senior year. And then in college, it became more of that because. You know, college sports was, I mean, even more intense than, I mean, high, high school sports here was more intense than high school sports, a lot of places. But, but, um, but yeah, when I was playing basketball that second year at Belmont, art was kind of my, you know, my space away um, in that too. And, um, and then as sports kind of transitioned from being, like sports was my getaway initially, but then it kind of got to be such a job that, you know, even though I still love playing, like, playing and, and practice and playing on teams and for coaches and yeah it's just it, it 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 it's a bit different so so art became kind of the thing that almost took the place of what sports was in my childhood like sports from fifth grade to eighth ninth grade is very different from 11th grade to you know through college or through pros if you get that far or, or whatever that um that might be mm -hmm. And we can look at some of the other pieces with the, um, yeah, as the, this is kind of the, yeah, as I was moving through those, those, those years. As I said, it was a 15 year sentence total and I'm working on a series called 15 that I'll exhibit as the sentence is coming to an end in April. So, so these pieces are gonna be shown April of 2023. And um, yeah, it's kind of my way of, of uh, yeah, moving through, moving through the last, the last of that, of this time. Mm -hmm. so you're married? I am, yeah, we were together before I went in and we weren't married then, but stayed together throughout and got married uh, a couple of years after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does this kind of work up? You said it was just a few sentences, you ran for three and a half or so. Mm -hmm. And you said you got out, so you still had 11 and a half. Yeah, the biggest impact was can't leave the country. 
And since my mom's side is from Trinidad, I couldn't, you know. So we had definitely had some family members pass away that were outside the country. And my grandmother passed. She passed the day that I got home, which is another, you know, another not a really hard story. But but um, but those were kind of the biggest things, like restriction of travel. As far and then work, there were some restrictions as far as what you could do for work. But um, but but then of course because I ended up being an artist, which is you know it's entrepreneurial. There's there's not a, I didn't. I didn't I ended up not needing to be hired anymore because I'm kind of working for myself. Yeah, but um, but those are some of the biggest restrictions. Work and then housing. If you try to like get an apartment, it's really hard to get an apartment as a, you know, as a faculty, someone who has a felony. Um, teaching, I taught at USM for a little bit, but I couldn't teach at a metro public school without a felony, which is some of the really ironic, you know, you know, the irony of you know, being at a private school, I can't teach an MBA because MBA just, you know, they just decide, you know, they decide if they want you to, but, you know, Metro has all those sort of rules and regulations that, um, that are kind of external. Um, and so, so yeah, so, so there's, there's some of those things that, that uh, yeah, that you, but it's also, I mean, I, I knew guys that said they'd rather flatten their sentence. They'd rather do it all inside because they don't want to be checking in with people and whatever and, of course, I looked at it like, as soon as you can let me out of here, I'm out of here, and I'll follow whatever rule I got to follow, and um, and kind of have <laughs> for the you know for the past yeah past ten years or so. And, yeah, I don't know why somebody wanted to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, and I think a big part of that is is kind of being conditioned to a certain you know way of life, and there's certain there's certain things that some people feel like they need to live. Like there's and some people don't have. I think that's part of it. I think there's some people that, that knew they couldn't pass drug tests and they knew that if they got out then they were going to fail a drug test and they'd have to go back and some of it was addiction, some of it was, you know, just coping. Like they found like the only way they could cope with their life to that point had been smoking marijuana and so they'd rather just stay and do their time and then get out and then fail a drug test and have to start all over and and so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, um, yeah, there's, there's a guy that I drew in here, his name is Shine, and when he got out, I was actually in his, in the unit when he got out, he got out after 31 years, and when he got out, he said, well, I guess they're putting me out. It's like, he felt almost like somebody's putting him out of his house, you know, like we were his, you know, we were his community, this is what he knew, this is what was, yeah, that was home, 31 years, that's, that's a life. Um, but um, but he did. He got out. He did well. At least as, as long as I got to keep up with him. And uh, but yeah, it is. It's pretty complex. That that. Um, mm -hmm. So you said you painted that. You said Gene. Mm-hmm. Like, what's your what's your favorite surface to paint on? Um, it's probably still canvas. Um, but the fabric, the jeans, and then that piece in that back corner, which is painted on fabric. Um. I really enjoy the fabric also because the, the figure, you see that kind of the, the, the detail part of that that's inside the coat, the face and the body and the hands, that's all just the print of that fabric. And so, so that's, I do enjoy painting on fabric a lot because it brings something interesting to the, to the piece. But, Is that hard to like paint on? It, it absorbs, you know, the, the jeans absorb paint a lot, so you kind of have to prime it first. But, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, thank you all. Great questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. And Mr. Booker will be back next week as part of the. Our show. Now I'll be at Sunday. Thank you. Great to meet you all. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's great. Great to meet you. It's awesome. It's good to meet you.